This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn. Mitch LaFawn. Welcome to this Canadian episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFawn as a Dave from Sum 41 joins me. They have a new album out called Order in Decline. I have to say, I saw the band last year at a festival in Quebec. Never seen the band before. They were great. They they really were. They they were great live. And, and this new album, Order in Decline, has a single out called Out for Blood. Fantastic song. Uh, fantastic, fantastic song. Anyway, speaking of live, I recently had a chance to see Little Steven in Montreal, and I have to say that was it, it, it was a interesting show. You know they. You would think that maybe doing a little Steven show or being the guy from Bruce Springsteen, you might get a cover or two, but you don't. It is uh, all his stuff, and uh, the show was sold out. People just absolutely loved it. Anyway, it, it, it was very, very fun. So so if little Steven rolls into town, uh, do go check him out. And uh, next week, I will be checking out Tesla and Def Leppard. And here's a fun little thing. Uh, Tesla has a new guitar tech. And his name is Steve. And, um, well, they found him, uh, thanks to me. Uh, And I don't want to sound like I'm name dropping or anything. But anyway, I got a call from uh, Frank. And he said, hey, I need a guitar tech. Uh, Do you 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 want a job? And, And I don't tech. Really, my only, only talent is talking. I'm good at talking. That's about it. Well, okay, I have a few other talents, but 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 talking is my thing. Now, if a band needs me to sell merch, okay, give me a call. Or if you need me just to talk, <laughs> I, I can do that. Anyway, uh, I pointed them in the direction of, of Steve. Steve's been around the music biz for, for a while, uh, basically playing 300 gigs a year in a small... You know, in small clubs around Montreal and stuff, but he's 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 gone out and done stuff with uh, some other bands. And um, anyway, so it's going to be interesting to to go out and and see Tesla. And I plan on seeing uh, Tesla and uh, Def Leppard. By the way, I plan on seeing the shows in Quebec, Montreal, and Ottawa. And it'll be nice to to have a buddy on the crew that that I had something to uh, to do with. So hopefully, everything works out and. The relationship is a long-standing one, but uh, you know, hey, making dreams come true, right? That's 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 what we're supposed to do. Anyway, um, we are going to uh, continue this Mitch Marathon month with uh, with Dave of Some Forty One. And notice, by the way, not saying his last name. You want to know why? Can't pronounce it. No clue how to pronounce it. Not even going to make an attempt. So it's just going to be Dave. Mitch and Dave today, nobody else. Uh, what else is happening in, in, in the rock world? Uh, there is, of course, the uh, Monsters of Rock cruise that comes up in February that you should go check out. Also, the Mega Cruise. We've all heard about Dave Mustaine's um, health issues, you know, throat cancer. And, and, of course, we wish him a speedy, speedy recovery and, and, and get back on stage soon, Dave. But Mega Cruise which is the Mega Death Cruise, is going to take place uh, regardless. Uh, nothing has been said officially as to what's going to happen. Is Mega Death not, just not going to perform? Is Mega Death going to perform with Dave? Is Mega Death going to perform with a whole bunch of guest vocalists? Either way. Either way, it's going to be spectacular, and you should definitely uh, head out and grab yourself a cabin on the Mega Cruise. Now, I have never been on a rock cruise, and I probably should go on a rock cruise. Um, I've got to say, I've made every excuse over the years to not go. You know, oh, the kids are in school. Oh, it, it's it's so far from Montreal. To, it's, oh, I, I don't like being on boats, which, well, mind you, I don't. I mean, I like being on boats. My body doesn't like me being on boats. Um, But of course, you know, a a little rowboat on an open sea compared to a cruise ship, not exactly the same thing. Anyway, do check that out uh, or or check me out on on a cruise. Wouldn't that be fun? Anyway, um, 
boy, so much. Oh, what else is happening? Heavy Montreal is is coming up at the end of July 2019. This is 2019 after all. And I will be at uh, both dates. In fact, uh, the night before on uh, July 26th, I will be at Honeymoon Suite in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And Honeymoon Suite, one of the greatest Canadian bands ever. I mean, uh, to me, it's my favorite band. People are going to throw Rush and Triumph and Lover Boy and all kind. Now, mind you, I love Lover Boy too. Um, but just Honeymoon Suite, man. That and Brian Adams. The, the you know. Uh, and then we've got Heavy Montreal, July twenty seventh and twenty eighth. Slayer is going to be there. Slash is going to be there. But more importantly, if you uh, go to my socials, my Facebook and my Twitter. Uh, every so often, uh, a contest will pop up where you can win uh, passes to the uh, to the festival uh, festival passes, not backstage passes. And uh, I've been tweeting that now. That's going to come to an end in about a week or so because we've actually got to pick winners and uh, sort of move the, the whole process along. But but do check out uh, check that out if you if you're interested in checking out the festival. And then uh, after that, boy, life's going to get busy. Uh, after the three Def Leppard shows, we've got Honeymoon Suite and um, Heavy Montreal. And then we've got Brian Adams uh, twice with Billy Idol. And we've got Alice Cooper. And then we've got um, Boy Iron Maiden. Uh, I've got Hart as well. Anyway, uh, enough about what I'm doing. Uh, let us get over to what Dave. Uh, you're only getting Dave. I'm not, I'm not saying anything else. So let's get over to what's uh, going on with Dave. From Sum 41, uh, the new album is Order in Decline. It comes out July 19th. And this interview features my uh, my favorite segment of any interview, the fabulous, fabulous publicist cut-in that says, you've got one question. Normally, uh, on, on shows would cut that out. But I find that so fascinating and so endearing that I'm leaving it in. I, 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 you know, luckily it's not a regular feature, but maybe it should be. I should just have every publicist just cut in and go, hey, Mitch, you've got one question left. Favorite part. Anyway, I'm leaving that in there. So uh, take a listen. And uh, when you hear the, um, God, when you, when you hear the cut in, head over to my Twitter at Mitch LaFon and say, I heard the cut in and who knows? Maybe we'll do something. I'll, I'll give away a T-shirt or, or I'll, I'll say, hey, thank you for listening. Or, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But we, I think we're going to have to make a game out of the dreaded publicist cut-in. Fabulous, fabulous publicist cut-in. Anyway, uh, Order in Decline, July 19th, 2019. It comes out. First single is Out for Blood. It is fantastic. R- truly fantastic. And here is, I'm not saying his last name. Dave from Sum 41. We are speaking with Dave Baksh from Sum 41. The new album is Order in Decline. And uh, I've got to say, Dave, first of all, hello. But I have been listening to the album. It's a freaking masterpiece. I mean, this thing is brilliant. It, it is a great, great record. You know, I really think that uh, that Biz outdid himself when uh, he was writing this one. It's... It, um it was incredible to hear the demos. We, we got them and they were complete songs. It wasn't just like, Oh, okay. we got verse chorus here, verse chorus here. He just, he had them and he was like, okay, well, I need a solo here. I need a line here. I need a hook here. I need backups here. And the way he, uh, he orchestrated and produced this record, um, it was like working with a pro who had been doing records for the past like 50 years. Well, okay, so let me talk to you about um, self-producing. I, I just had this great conversation with Tom Worman, who who did, you know, the Ted Nugents and the Motley Crews and all that. And, and Yeah. Yeah, and we were talking about how, um, a good friend of mine, we were talking about how you need these outside ears. Talk to me about letting a band member produce an album and not relying on outside ears. Is there a danger in that? And is that something that you want to keep doing or is this sort of like, well, we'll do it for this record, maybe the last one. And we'll, we'll talk about getting a producer the next time. I think that it, it's, it has been a 20 year run for us now. 
and we've we've kind of always gone with um with producers and uh i think that in order for us to have reached a point where we could make a record like this where we did exactly what we wanted um you need somebody like uh like derek at the helm because um Derek is, is very, he'll question himself very easily. And he has the confidence to know if something isn't worth being on the record or if something isn't working as a part because um, his expertise is songwriting. Whereas mine is, you know, going up and, and playing and, and, and being a guitar player, I'm, I'm garbage as a songwriter. And especially compared to somebody who's been doing it for, for 20 years now. And he's, he's just got something and it, it really shined through on this record. It really does. So, so talk to me about sort of going in there and making a new album because you had been away from the band for a while. And, and of course, you, you did come back with uh, 13 Voices. But when you make an album in 2019 or maybe starting it in 2000, do you sort of look back to the first Sum 41 album and say, OK, we've got a sound. Let's recapture that. Or at this point in the career, do you say, hey, you know what? It's time to stretch our wings. Do, do you sort of go the, the ACDC route and, and have your sound? Or you you go sort of like more Madonna and just say, hey, we're just going to do whatever we feel is right? <laughs> I think with us, we've always just wanted to go heavier. And um, I mean, it's, it's something that a lot of music around us, uh, it's not very trendy to do these days. And I, I think we, we've, we've just always had a thing where our head is down. We are in our circle of creation and what comes out comes out. And as far as a absolute, um, choice as to where the, t- where to take the record, I don't think that that exists. I, th- I think it's just, he'll sit down, he'll start writing riffs, and whatever direction the song goes in, that's that's where it goes. I'm I'm sure the guy has thousands of songs he hasn't even shown us because they aren't some 41 songs. But um, one thing that I think is always common in the the uh, the some 41 catalog is that there's a sound and a formula that you will hear that uh, makes the some 41 sound unique. And makes it something that can uh, that can differentiate from, uh, especially from from our peers in pop punk. Yeah, really. Well, in fact, let me let me just quickly say, since you mentioned heavier on your Into the Mouth of Badness uh, album with Brown Brigade, <laughs> yeah. right? You you covered Iron Maiden, and you've also uh, cited Diamond Head and some of those bands as influences. Uh, just quickly talk to me about your. Uh, love for metal and, and and getting sort of those traditional maideny type riffs onto albums and, and covering the song actually because it's it's a great cover I gotta say oh thanks man I, I mean our my first um, kind of uh, exposure to live music was a cousin of mine named Stefan and he had a brother Vaughn who ended up playing in Brown Brigade and um, the two of them were in a band and you know they would play the local pizza shop and it would be me, you know, scrounging up a couple bucks for a slice and a pop and watching my cousins play heavy metal. And from there, from there, they kind of noticed that I took an interest. And so they would feed me things like, you know, anthrax and other different types of metal. And I was already discovering, you know, hip hop, rap and reggae from, the radio, my dad's record collection and, you know, old bands like the ventures. And so there's always been a wide array of, um, of music, but looking back, it's, it's like, it's kind of surprising how much of it was actually get really heavily guitar driven. And I think that that is the thing that kind of, um, that drew me to metal at first. But then, um, after about like, uh, like 13, 14 years old, uh, my cousin Vaughn kind of, uh, had me come hang out with his group of friends. And we were all big metalheads. And 
everybody just treated me like I was an equal. There was no, there was no kind of garbagey induction or hazing or anything like that. You know, we, we just all loved heavy metal. We talk heavy metal. We'd go listen to records together and, you know, smoke hash, smoke pot and just chat about music. And it was, it was just such a, an amazing spot to be because, um, you know, there was, there was a little bit of tension, uh, racially in Ajax, uh, growing up and being a, uh, like a guy new kid that, uh, that my cousins and I, uh, went through. Well, excuse me, not guy new kid, a first generation Canadian kid in a guy new family. Well, and just real quick on, on, uh, on, on that is Brown Brigade a, uh, something that still exists is something that you're still going to do or now that you've come back to the band uh, you've decided okay I'm just going to focus on some 41 and by the way you announced that you were leaving on July 8th 2000, uh, July 9th 2015 we're recording July 7th so it's almost been four years now <laughs> you're almost at your four year anniversary yeah that's right right yeah I, we're, I mean as far as Brown Brigade it, it's always going to be a thing no matter what my, my cousins and I like we we love getting together and playing music. And I think that's literally what it's about. But as, as far as getting signed, doing any deals or touring, anything like that, I don't really see it in the future of, uh, of Brown Brigade, but, uh, I don't know. We, we just, yeah, my cousin and I, we get together, we write and we, we play it back and we decide, you know, is this good? And most of the times it's like, eh, it's not that great. Well, hey, listen, the last album was good. Uh, let's, <laughs> let, let's go, let's go to 2006, uh, May of, 20, of, 20, of okay. 2006. You, you decide it's time to step out a bit, step away from the band. Uh, talk to me about that decision and also looking back on it, was it the right decision to sort of re-energize yourself and recharge the batteries? Or do you look back on it now and go, what the f- was I thinking? I should have just st- <laughs> stuck it out. You know, with, with everything going on, on at home with my family, um, my, uh, at the time, my wife and I were, uh, were a little bit rocky. So what I needed to do was get home, see my family, you know, and as you said, recharge for sure. But it was a point where I was in the middle of finding out that, you know, things at home weren't great things on tour weren't great. And, uh, it was just kind of like, there was no escape. So to, in order to not have people knocking down my family's door or having people be like, Oh, Brown fast family is messed up, blah, blah, blah. I just kind of said like, you know, we got some musical differences left. And, uh, the only thing I really regret about that time is not telling the guys, what was really going on as far as coming home and being with my family. I have no regrets whatsoever. I would do it all over again. If the, if the opportunity to, um, to do both as I have right now, where family is great and music is great. I mean, there's, there's no question that, you know, I, I rather be playing music, but if things get dark again, like uh, they did, you know, back then, of, of course. I mean, I, I would expect anybody in my shoes that uh, that puts family in such an, in, an, on such an important pedestal, I would think that they would do the, the, the they would make the exact same decision. Yeah, I, I would too. So when you decide to come back now, now in, in May of 2014, Derek I, I announces that he has uh, liver and kidney failure. Uh, grievously ill, al- mm. almost fatally ill. Not to be um, morose about it, is that a point mm. where where you where you see that news and you sort of say, you know what, uh, maybe it's time to, to to reach out and and, and go back. And w- was that sort of the catalyst where you said, hey, we had a good thing. Maybe, maybe it's it's time to to, to call them up well, and say, you know, how how did that work for you? Well, it was actually around 2013 that uh, we had started speaking again. And, um, it was, it was about six or seven months before, um, before the, uh, that he had collapsed and he had, he had actually died on the hospital bed and, and been 
brought back, but we spoke a, a little bit, but it was more to, to rekindle the friendship because, um, I don't think he was ready to go back out on tour at that point. And then, um, and then the news came and it was horrible. It was, it was such a crazy shock. I remember hearing the news from uh, a friend of mine um, down in LA and just falling backwards into the wall in my house and immediately thinking, okay, how do I get out there? How do I chop off a piece of my liver and give it to this guy? How can I help? And, um, the only thing I could do was, you know, get in touch with his wife and just be like, listen, if there's anything I can do, let me know. You know, and we uh, played the waiting game and he uh, got himself uh, back to to uh, a state where I could go and visit him. So I went down to, uh, to L.A. to go visit the two of them. We hung out for a little bit and it's just it's the same like we we were friends all over again. And uh, we hadn't talked during the time I had left because I think there was a little bit of, of, um, uh, there was a little bit of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was a little, a little bit of a malice between the two of us as far as our feelings towards each other. And um, it's, uh, it just all washed away because, um, when when I thought about, okay, I have to go and be with my family, I didn't think about the fact that I was deserting another family, and especially a family that was um, that was at the point where it could have broken at any point. So um, I think the the advantage of leaving was family but the regret of leaving was also family. So it was just, yeah, yeah uh, it was a difficult choice. That's for sure. It was. So, so now that you're all back together and yeah, and, and he's gone through that and, and you went through what you went through. Is there a greater appreciation for what you created with all killer, no filler? Because it, you know, to be, to be in a band, to be on top, to be able to tour and have the, the singles, it's, it's very ephemeral and it's very, very special. Is there a greater appreciation for what Sum 41 is and has done? We 100% realize that we are in, you know, you know, a millionth of a percentage of the, uh, the earth being able to do this. And we, we don't really sit and, and talk about it. We just know it. It, we just know that it is insane to think that when we met in transportation tech in high school, that this far down the road, we'd be on stage almost every night. It, it, it just, it boggles the mind to think that that was the outcome of, of, um, of us just rehearsing and writing songs together. Right. It, it, it's working out great. So let, let's quickly talk about the, uh, the yeah. first single, Out for Blood. It has uh, reached the top 20 on Billboard's Mainstream mm -hmm. Rock. First time in 14 years, almost 15 years that you've been on the charts. Um, quickly talk to me about, first of all, that song is a, a masterpiece. It, it is. It just punches you right in the face. It's glorious. But Thank but, you. Yeah, j just talk to me a little bit about... Uh, first of all, the importance of being on the charts and being able to put an album that gets the the attention and gets noticed because a lot of bands, whether you're Def Leppard or Bon Jovi or, or Iron Maiden, right, they, they had great success 20 years ago and then they're never able to get back. So you've done sort of the unimaginable and you've gotten yourself back in the top 20 on Billboard, you know, more than a decade after the last single. Uh, talk to me about uh, the single and the importance of, of Billboard and being relevant. Well, I mean, obviously, the importance of being relevant is to keep on um, getting the crowd to expand, of course. Um, the importance of being on, on Billboard is um, that's a massive, 
that's basically a the data done on the research of what's happening with song. So to know that something that we're a part of has done so well on Billboard, it's it's unbelievable. Like it, we didn't expect that this was going to be something that uh, got us back into the mainstream rock charts. That's for sure. I mean, I mean, we we we've always been lucky enough as a band where the crowd has expanded as we've gone. But uh, like you said, there hasn't been a lot of, of radio support over the years um, after uh, Chuck. And to be back in this position again, it, it's just inspiring. It makes us want to work even harder and, and be out there with these people that are showing this love to us. Hey, Mitch, sorry, sorry to interrupt, guys, but we, Mitch, we have time for one more question. Oh, yeah, okay. go for it, go for it. All right, sorry, I thought we had half an hour. Okay, um, well, then, uh, just uh, real quick, Dave, uh, oh, where do I want to go? Uh, since we talked about Iron Maiden and, and the influences there, uh, talk to me about some of the guitar heroes that you were looking up, looking up to growing up. Well, I, I think the first hero I would have had would have been Scotty Ian from Anthrax. And uh, I think that that is what is a big influence on my rhythmic approach to playing. So um, as a guitar player, my uh, everything will start for me from a drum beat or uh, an accented rhythm. So that's where my solo lifts start. That's where my, my riffs start. Everything has to do with a drum. So melody comes into play after that for me, after I pick up the accents, this and that. So I've always leaned towards players like that, you know, guys like, um, you know, Tom Morello from Anthrax as well. James Hetfield is a great rhythm player who was also able to, to, to do rhythm. And, uh, you know, later on in life, guys like Leo Nocentelli were massive parts of, of influence for me. So, I mean, it's, it's all mainly rhythm guitar players and actually surprisingly not a lot of lead players. You know, guys like Randy Rhodes, of course, of course, influenced everybody. But uh, yeah, even guys like Dimebag, who were so rhythm driven, but could shred leads. I always, you know, opted to dissect his rhythm playing and, and, you know, do what I could to add it to my style. Yeah, Dime's great. I, I had a nice uh, a nice time on tour with them uh, in Montreal with Dime and Anthrax back in the day, and it was a fun, fun time. Uh, Dave, an absolute pleasure. I thought we had half an hour. We don't, but still, we got everything that we needed. Order and Decline is out July 19th. Uh, do pick it up. It is great. And uh, as we say in Montreal, merci. Merci beaucoup. Oh, thank you so much. Anytime you want to do this again, you just let us know, okay? Absolutely. Uh, I look forward to it. And uh, please, when you get to, uh, to Montreal, let's, let's do it again. Sounds good, Mitch. You take care, my brother. Cheers. Have a good one. You're listening to Rock Talk with Mitch LaFond. Rock Talk.